It's the real news. I'm Aaron Maté. After years of trying, the United Nations has finally established an independent probe of the Saudi-led war on Yemen. The Saudi Kingdom has blocked the investigation for years, including with threats of economic retaliation. But it finally caved today in the face of overwhelming pressure. Saudi Arabia, though, did win a major concession. It did defeat a more powerful commission of inquiry that could have brought crimes to the International Criminal Court. Meanwhile, the U.S. role in the Saudi-led war is under pressure at home. Four lawmakers have introduced a measure to end U.S. involvement unless Congress votes to authorize it. Mark Weisbrot is co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, and he joins me now. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Aaron. Let's react first to this news just from today. Uh, it's been a long effort by international campaigners to establish some form of independent commission to investigate abuses by all sides in the side led war, uh, more than you know, three years after it began. Um, finally, it, uh, or two years after it began, sorry. Uh, finally, the UN established one today. Your reaction to that, Mark? Well, this has been a long struggle within the UN. It's been going on at the Security Council for a while with various countries uh, trying to, uh, you know, bring this to the attention of the world, actually, because this is the problem that, you know, it's, it's not even well known enough. And so I think this is another step uh, forward in trying to, uh, trying to, you know, get some accountability in the international sphere. But I think what's happening in the U.S. Congress is even more important because it's hard to see how the Saudis could and their coalition could maintain this war and all the devastation and starving uh, people really into submission if the United States government was not helping them. And that's where the Congress can really play a role. And I think that's uh, where our best hope is of stopping these uh, you know, what various humanitarian groups have called uh, crimes against uh, humanity. And, uh, you know, this is, this, um, this resolution uh, uh, under the, it's uh, under the War Powers Resolution, they are actually uh, forcing, they're going to force a vote and a debate in the House for the first time on something that most of this country doesn't even know about. So I think that's really, really important. Right. They're forcing this debate because the uh, House GOP leadership doesn't want it, uh, but they're managed to get around that. You know, one irony, Mark, is that the U.S. has been waging these unauthorized military actions abroad and claiming that they have authorization under the 2001 authorization for use of military force that was passed after 9-11. It was passed to fight al Qaeda. And the irony there is that the side that the U.S. is helping Saudi Arabia bomb, the Houthis, they're the ones actually fighting al-Qaeda. And in bombing them, that has tacitly actually helped al-Qaeda grow its presence inside Yemen. No, that's absolutely right. Well, that's a long pattern. I mean, look at how much support that uh, U.S. Uh, either gave directly or indirectly to the groups in Syria, uh, including the Islamic State. Uh, you know... That's that's a problem. It really it really shows in a lot of ways how little they really care about the terrorist threat that they've been using for as an excuse for everything since 9/11. Because these other priorities are always coming first. This is a pure power thing that's going on in terms of U.S. support for the Saudi coalition in in Yemen. In fact, there's a lot of analysts who think, and I think it's plausible that the reason they're do, you know that President Obama decided to do it in the first place. Uh, was because the Saudis were really upset with the nuclear deal with Iran, and this was kind of a deal he made in order to make them accept this. So uh, this is the kind of power politics that's always presented to us as some kind of national security, some alliance based on protecting people here in the United States, and it's very clear that it has nothing that actually, if anything, it makes things more dangerous for us at the same time that it's causing terrible destruction there. Right, Mark. Yeah. Speaking of uh, foreign policy decisions undermining or threatening actual national security, you've pointed this out that in the in, in the case of North Korea as well, when uh, right now we have this 
dangerous talk from both sides, the very real, the very real fear of military conflict, even the use of nuclear weapons, that there actually are sensible proposals on the table that have just been dismissed by the U.S. Uh, a few months ago, uh, China was pushing for a measure uh, that would that for some kind of deal in which both sides would would freeze uh, their their activities. North Korea would freeze its nuclear program in exchange for uh, curtailing U.S military activities on the Korean Peninsula, including these big war games. And it was the Trump administration that rejected that. They wouldn't even consider it if, and, and this is an obvious starting point, and it's very little to give up uh, for the North Koreans to actually stop uh, or freeze their testing, missile testing and nuclear testing. And it shows how much, uh, and you know, I, you know, I wrote about that and I also cited this a piece in the New York Times because it was by David Sanger, who's, you know, one of their most experienced uh, foreign policy reporters and editors, and he's uh, knows as much as 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 you know probably most of the people that he cites, and he said very clearly that we're not really worried about the idea that uh, Kim Jong Un would actually send a missile to the United States, attack the United States first, because that would be suicidal and he would never do anything like that. Uh, it's a retaliatory response that they have and uh, that he's trying to have and that uh, we don't, that our government doesn't want that, uh, wanted to have that because that would reduce U.S. power in Asia. And I think that's the, you know, again, that's the mainstream view of the foreign policy establishment which Sanger pretty much represents very consistently. And, uh, and that's, what, that's how they look at it. And this is how they see the world, that it's worth taking these risks of war in which pushing to the brink of a war in which millions of people could die so as to not lose this certain advantage that they have in Asia. And in fact, uh, Dan Coates, uh, the uh, director of national intelligence, said just uh, a couple of months ago, that he said this publicly, uh, that North Korea is never going to give up its nuclear weapons because after what happened to Libya, as you know, Libya did that. Libya gave up its nuclear program and, and look what happened to Gaddafi. And of course, look what happened to Iraq. And so this shows too, I think, how there are huge costs to these imperial uh, policies. This, idea of the United States trying to just always uh, going for power and in the short in the short run and then in the long run it causes bigger much bigger problems and bigger risks and wars uh, ahead which is which is why going back to our story that we let off with one of the few ways to curb it is through either international accountability via the UN and investigating human rights abuses as they're doing now. And also, of course, and more importantly, as you pointed out, with uh, US lawmakers at home finally posing some kind of challenge. Uh, and we'll obviously follow what happens next with all these stories. Mark Weisbrot, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.